Oh my God, I've had a few contractions and I already feel my baby outside of my body. What is happening? <laughs> Guys, we have so much to talk about. Finally, four months later, have the chance to sit down and dive into our birth story with you. I'm guessing that you're coming to this video from my birth vlog. If you're not, you should go watch that one first. You just witnessed the wonderful breach home birth that we had in all of its glory. But unfortunately, that is not the full story. And today I'm finally going to tell you everything. So it is time to dive into the nitty gritty, good, bad, ugly, perfect, magical, challenging, terrifying, parts of our birth story. To do that, we need to back it all the way up to before I even got pregnant. I've shared a lot in previous videos about my health history and our journey to conceiving, so I will point you towards my pregnancy playlist if you have missed that part of the story. But to summarize, we went from PCOS, endometriosis, and Hashimoto's diagnosis, sitting in doctor's offices, being told we would never conceive naturally, to by the grace of God, conceiving our third month trying, to at 10 weeks, learning that I have a bicornet uterus. Now, there is so much I could say about that, but at the time during this pregnancy, we did not know the severity of the bicornet. We didn't know if I just had a mild heart shape. We didn't know if I had a full septum completely separating the two sides of my uterus, but we were told that we were lucky to be as far as we were if we did make it full term. If the size and shape of my uterus did not impede the baby from growing full term, one of the complications that could arise was a breech baby. Oftentimes what happens is baby just doesn't have the space to move and flip and get into the right position head down for birth. The entirety of my pregnancy after 10 weeks, we knew this information. I, of course, if you know me, did everything humanly possible to try to prevent baby from being breached and keep baby head down. I literally did weekly chiropractic visits, uterine unwinding with my midwife, bodywork fascial massages to create space in my hips, all the stretches, I did everything. But around 33 weeks, when baby was big enough, I really started to sense that baby was on the left side of my womb. And I was kind of getting the sense that baby was stuck. Around 36 weeks, we started to sense that maybe baby wasn't head down just based off the movements that I was feeling and not feeling at that time. So we did a sonogram at 36 and found out baby was breached. Now, as I shared in the birth blog, this brought up a lot of emotions for me. Frustration because I had spent so much time trying to prevent this. It really felt like defeat because it felt like that meant that I wasn't going to get the unmedicated home birth that I had dreamed of and spent my whole pregnancy preparing for. Most people don't deliver breech babies at home, at least not on purpose. We truly dove into the research, the stories, the education, everything that we could to study this and decide where we landed. And my midwife, she knows the Lord, she has surrendered to the spirit and she was like, sometimes I don't have peace and I don't even have a reason, but I have peace. Nothing is coming up for me to tell me that we shouldn't be doing this at home. We can do this if you want to, but you need to be on board. You need to believe that you can do this. You need to feel confident in this. And that's something that we really talked about. I think in general, if you are preparing for an unmedicated home birth, you have to believe that you can do it. You have to be on board. You have to have belief in the positive outcome. You cannot have fear and hesitation, but especially <laughs> knowing baby was breached. Even just one of us has no peace. We're not doing this. Katja and I did all the research, listened to all the podcasts, really understood all the different risks associated with breach vaginal birth. Ultimately, we were like, we want to do this. We believe we can do this. We know we can do this. What happened at that point was I'm going to do everything possible to flip this baby. I'm telling you, I had this knowing in my gut, this baby's not going to flip. I even went to an acupuncturist and I was like, I don't know why I'm doing this, but Catherine was like, let's just do it. Let's do everything we can. And I went to this woman, bless her heart. She was like, I flipped so many babies. This always works. And I was just like, it's not going to work. And it didn't work. That acupuncture made baby move and twist, but not enough to flip her. Baby is here because of the size and shape of my womb. Baby doesn't have the space that it needs to flip. I just had to get to that place of this is going to be a breech baby. And this was the wisdom from my midwife. Instead of trying to flip this baby, let's focus on maximizing space and optimizing your body to birth this baby however it's meant to be birthed. That is exactly the encouragement that I needed. I'm not kidding y'all. I probably spent an hour of every day those last couple weeks fully in an inversion. <laughs> let's just say I was doing it all. Instead of telling baby to flip, I was telling baby, I'm just creating space. I want you to take up all the room you need. I'm optimizing my body to birth this baby. 
baby however it is meant to be birthed. As we were preparing for this, we were also, as a team with my midwife, really doing a lot of due diligence and research in studying breech birth, understanding all the different things that can go wrong with different complications, the ways that breech babies get stuck. We watched so many videos of babies coming out feet first or butt first. One night my midwife came over and she was literally here for like eight hours until almost midnight, I think. And we watched so many videos and we really talked about it. One of the things that she talked about is how generally breach goes one of two ways. It happens really fast or it happens really slow. <laughs> It's just like duh. What can happen is if a baby is not head down, oftentimes there's not enough pressure on the cervix to fully dilate or it's just not the right positioning for baby to do the proper flips and to get the body progressing. And so that is often one of the complications with breach when pursuing vaginal delivery is it just, it just stalls out. Baby just gets stuck. That is kind of like the mindset that this entire pregnancy I was preparing for, just being a first time mom, knowing that I did not want to induce in any way. I wanted to let my body go into natural labor. So much of the wisdom that I received, even from the birth center, they had a 25% transfer rate to the hospital. And that was something that just kind of didn't sit right with me because I was like, that's a lot of people transferring. Like why? And they told me it's mostly first time moms who are just so fatigued because their labor is so long. They're done. They're over it and they want the drugs. Even from week five of being pregnant, even before I was pregnant, talking to friends who had had natural birth, that was wisdom that had been passed down to me was, plan for long, plan for slow, be prepared mentally for that. And so I was kind of expecting that. My fear was that that is what was going to happen. Breach was not going to progress. Baby was going to get stuck or something. And then we would have to transfer the hospital and I'd have a C-section. But when my midwife came over and we talked through all this, she and her infinite wisdom, this woman is a freaking baby womb whisperer. I can't even describe how genius and just brilliant this woman's baby mind is. I could talk about the magic of this woman forever. I am truly indebted to her and she knows. She came over again, Tuesday night. So I was 38 and a half. She brought over a birth stool because one of the things that she was researching in ways to help get baby out was like, how can we make sure that we're creating space? And one of the things in her wisdom of uterine unwinding and body work, she knows the power of moving the mom's body to create space for baby to come out. So we talked about doing different lunges, different squats and different things to create space. I bought a birth pool. I bought all my birth supplies previously and I had this beautiful white birth pool that I imagined birthing in. Once we found out baby was breached and we we're preparing for this, we talked about how it is not going to happen for me to deliver in the pool because generally breech babies, you often want to deliver on hands and knees. She wanted to have you know, the right access. We kind of knew I'm going to deliver on hands and knees, not going to happen in the pool. But we talked about how I could labor in the pool. We kind of just like very loosely without having a plan talked through everything that could happen. I'm telling you this woman, I don't know. It is truly a combination of just so much experience and knowledge and wisdom with her surrender to the spirit, trusting the magic and the beauty and the unknown of birth, which I could go on a total tangent of too. But I think she even said, I could kind of just visualize how this was going to happen. Like knowing your body, knowing your womb, knowing the position of the baby, knowing what we were seeing, I could kind of see how this was going to go down. So she said that night, y'all think about this. I'm a first time mom. She tells me, I think you're going to have the baby by this weekend. And I think it's going to be a fast labor. And we're like, okay, what do you mean a fast labor? Less than 20 hours, less than 12 hours. She's like, oh, I think it's gonna be less than six hours. And I was like, what? My husband, Kendra was like, are you crazy? What midwife tells their client that? She's like, I don't know y'all. I'm just, I feel like this is how it's gonna go down. So that was Tuesday night, Wednesday and Thursday. I'm continuing to create space in my body, all the things. Thursday night is when Kendra and I went for the walk on the golf course. At this point, I'm having tons of Braxton Hicks contractions, but I had been having them for weeks. I was drinking all the teas, doing all the things I was hand expressing colostrum. I was doing perineal massages. Like I was doing all the things. So it wasn't a surprise that that stuff was happening. I wasn't feeling any kind of like labor contractions, but I was having activity in my womb. That night I did feel, and I texted my midwife and again, this is the crazy thing. Okay. I told her that night when we were walking at the golf course, I said, I feel like baby's dropping. And one of the things we were praying for was for the butt to come down. We wanted butt first because if baby's kind of folded, if you imagine like back and legs, 
legs, but they're folded up where their legs are tucked up and their butts coming down in replacement of the head coming first. That is generally best for keeping things progressing because it essentially mimics the size of the head. What happens is if feet are coming through first, sometimes that's not enough to help the body fully open and dilate. So we were praying for the butt to come down. So I like texted her, I'm out walking. I feel like baby's dropping, praying for butt down. Went to sleep that night, actually slept great for the first time in a long time. Cause you know, you know, at the end of that pregnancy, you're not sleeping very good. And I woke up at 5 15 AM, like kind of to a startle because my water broke and it felt like a rubber band snapping, which is something I had heard some women describe how they feel it. exactly what it felt like. Like I heard it and I felt it, the snap, I like jumped out of bed and was kind of like leaking my waters on the way to the toilet. I was 39 weeks and zero days. This was happening. She was right coming by this weekend. I was trying not to panic and feel discouraged because I was having no contractions. So my water broke, cashmere was up doing laundry and actually he baked some meatballs for me. I said I wanted chicken meatballs as one of my like labor snacks <laughs> for some good protein. He texted our midwife, told her that my water broke, told our doula as well. He was like, she's not having any contractions yet. And again, my midwife, because she suspected that this would happen fast, she's like, okay, even though she's not having contractions, her water broke, I'm coming. So I took a shower and I was really like, if you watch the birth vlog, I think you can kind of sense it in me. I was really trying not to be discouraged because I'm like standing in there showering, trying not to be discouraged because I wasn't having contractions yet. My fear was like, I knew from my water breaking, we kind of had a ticking time bomb. In 24 hours, if baby wasn't coming, things weren't happening, like we were gonna end up at the hospital. Just the fact that I didn't have contractions yet, I was fighting some of that discouragement, like, oh, this is gonna be long and slow. This is gonna stall. Like, that's not what I wanted. So I was fighting that discouragement. One of the pieces of wisdom I received from so many different sources through this whole preparation process, ignore early labor. My friend Lana, who teaches the labor without fear course that I used to prep, she talks about this all the time. She has this beautiful video on homemaking and labor. Like you just ignore it. You pretend like it's not happening. So we're like, okay, we're gonna get back in bed. You saw a giving me a massage. I was listening to my meditation, trying to go back to sleep, but trying not to be discouraged. Then this is where things started to go crazy. At 6.32, so an hour and 15 minutes after my water broke, I had my first contraction. And y'all, when I say I was shocked at how intense this contraction was, I really did a lot of preparation. I knew this was going to be somewhat painful. I was not naive. I did not believe in pain-free birth. I didn't go into this thinking I was going to be in no pain and I could just breathe through it and not feel anything. I knew this is going to be hard and painful, but I also knew it starts slow and it ramps up. And when that first contraction hit, I was in bed and I was just like, I couldn't get comfortable. I couldn't talk through it. I could hardly breathe through it. And I was like, oh my God, this is just the first contraction. How bad is this going to get? And I kind of panicked a little bit in my brain. Cause again, I'm preparing myself. This could be 24 hours, could be long and slow. Maybe could like stall. So I was like, okay, don't panic. It's not that bad. You can do this. I was literally just like trying to fight off those fears in my brain. Cashmere, he was like out in the kitchen doing laundry. And I think he heard me kind of like, whoa, I just had my first contraction. I'm like, okay, ignore it, ignore it. Then my second one comes and I'm like, oh my God, this is so intense. I can't breathe. All the breath work prep I did, like I feel like it's not working right now. And he'll tell you, he came in and saw me laboring through a contraction on the bed and was kind of like, oh my God, this woman is not looking too good. Like, oh, I don't know about this. How bad is this gonna get? Like he was kind of doubting me, watching me react to these early contractions as I was in my own brain, but bless his heart, he did not express that to me at the time. My third contraction, I was like, oh my God, I think these are happening. Like these are long and these are fast and I need to get out my contraction timer app. My midwife had sent me an app where I could log my um, contractions and she could watch it in the app so she could see what was happening. I logged my first one, which was really my third one. I was like, okay, that was 90 seconds long. If you've gone through this, if you've used one of these apps, you know at the end of the contraction, after you stop it, it shows you green happy face, a yellow medium face, or a red angry face. So you're supposed to rate like how intense was the contraction. Mind you, in my brain, I am like, oh my God, that was at least a yellow. This is just beginning. Like this is gonna get so much worse. So I said green, literally just to convince myself, it's okay, this is easy, you can do this. It can get worse, you can handle it. Like I had to tell myself that. So I'm 
I'm like logging these as green. I time the next couple and I'm like, okay, these are 90 seconds long and three to five minutes apart. And I knew from all our birth prep, the phases, it's like early labor, all these phases of labor, you reach active labor at 90 seconds long and three to four minutes apart. So I was like, we're already there. What? So that's when I was kind of like, okay, she's right. This is gonna happen quickly. I'm not gonna do this for 24 hours. Like there's no way, like we just skipped all that early stuff and we are in it. This is it, this is happening. We're in active labor. So that helps me a little bit mentally, I think, because I was like, I got this, I can do this. And so I kind of learned how to settle in a little, like work through the contractions. Just didn't have those early ones and we went straight to the hard stuff. The next few pass and I'm like sending this to my midwife. She's on the way. She's like, okay, I'm seeing your contractions. I'm seeing that they're long and close together, but you're rating them as green. So I'm thinking like, it's not that bad. She's like, I opened that door. She came into our front door and she heard me in our bedroom laboring through a contraction. Casher will tell you, he saw her eyes get so big and he's like, she knew we're in this. She comes back and is checking on me. I'm on the toilet at this point. I don't know why I was working through these on the toilet. Not that long after she was there, I said to her and Casher, it was just the two of them there so far. I was like, guys, I feel baby. And I think both of them thought that meant like, I'm feeling baby drop, I'm feeling baby engage. But no, y'all, I was like, I feel like baby's coming. I reached up there and felt little toes sticking out with my fingers. I was like, oh my God. I've had like a few contractions and I already feel my baby outside of my body. Like what is happening? So again, one of the things we talked about was hoping that baby would come butt first, not feet first. But I'm telling you, I didn't even think about this. I was not like, oh no, the feet are coming out. I was just like, this is happening. We're gonna do this. So I'm a lot calmer than I thought I would be considering how I'm telling you I was kind of working through some mental panic there. Like, I actually was really calm and steady and just zoned in. So if you watch the birth vlog and you see like the first footage after my first contraction where I show you the first footage of me like leaning against the stool once the midwife was there, y'all, baby's toes were already out at that point. So my midwife has just the most calming presence and I just trusted this woman with my life. I had so much faith and trust in her to guide us through this process. Cashmere was just my steady rock. I feel like I kind of just clicked in, got into the zone, like let's do this. And I was leaning against the stool basically on hands and knees. That's how I was feeling most comfortable working through those contractions. I think one of the things that shocked me was how much I was already vocalizing through the contractions. I didn't expect that of myself as much as I watched and prepared for birth stuff. I feel like I did see some women groaning and moaning and kind of like vocalizing through contractions. But I didn't expect that of myself. It's not like I like consciously did that, but it was happening literally from contraction one overtook my body and it was the way I was naturally coping. I knew I was supposed to keep my jaw, my mouth open and relaxed. And I was just like, uh, it was just coming out it, through this whole thing. Probably the thing that blew my mind the most, even though I knew this to actually experience it, how much our bodies just do what they're meant to do. Best thing I could do was just let my body do its thing because it was gonna do it no matter what. <laughs> so it was really just that like surrendered experience. But at this point we're working baby down. I'm not pushing at all yet. I'm just letting these contractions open up. That's what sounds so crazy is my baby's feet were already out but I wasn't even fully dilated. And you see that in the vlog. I say to my midwife like, I don't feel pushy yet, which I think was kind of trippy in my mind that like my baby's already hanging out. I don't feel the need to push yet. And she's like, that's okay. We knew once we got to like umbilicus, that's kind of where you have a little bit of a timeline to get baby out safely and comfortably. The feet hanging out for hours was not a concern, which sounds so crazy, but it's true. I'm at this point just like breathing through my contractions, trying to allow my body to open. I feel like that was really just the magic of being in the moment with my midwife and my husband, just reflecting on like, we're doing this. That's the emotion that was really coming up for me. Oh my gosh, this is happening. All this time we've prayed for this, we've worked for this. It's here, it's happening. Anything could have happened, but I feel like I knew we're having this baby here now in this home. The baby's already out. So that allowed me to settle in and not be like, oh no, is something going wrong? Do I need to transfer to the hospital? Do I need the drug? None of that was even crossing my brain. Maybe one of the assistant midwives showed up next. I'm not really sure exactly how it trickled in, but my midwife always brings one assistant. She did bring two assistants for this birth just because because we knew it was breach. As much as wanting to have extra hands, as well as I think a lot of midwives just wanting to be there for the magic of this breach experience. A lot of people don't get to witness this. There were two assistant midwives and those were the two women that I had never met before. When I was texting my midwife, we didn't know what would happen the next morning. We had scheduled for me to meet one of them Saturday morning because she had just recently attended multiple surprise breaches. So she was going to tell me all about her experience. She was like, they went great. So I was looking forward to meeting her and hearing these positive experiences from a woman who 
is going to be there with me. So my midwife, my husband, the two assistant midwives, my doula, and then the last person who showed up was my friend. She was my friend in nutrition school. She is a lactation consultant. And y'all, this is so weird. It is so the Lord because we were literally up until the day before we had this baby trying to debate, like, do we hire a photographer? Birth photographers are so expensive. I feel like I care more about the video than the photos. So I was like, I feel like I want more of like, instead of hiring a professional, I want more of a friend that I trust that I would feel safe in that space, just like capturing the video so that I can create this birth vlog. So literally I asked her the day before, well, I had asked her a couple days before, but we like confirmed the day before she was going to come. So she showed up and Cashmere was like texting her that morning. Like if you're going to come, you need to get here. <laughs> so she did. So those were the five people in my birth space. And what blows my mind is how in the zone I was, those people just like faded into the background and I didn't even know they were there. Thankfully they were very quiet and out of the way and respectful and not like impeding on my space. But that's what blew my mind. I saw these two strangers that I've never met come in. <laughs> I saw my friend come in, but I just was so in the zone that they just faded away. And it was literally like my midwife and my husband and me and my baby, which was really, really cool. And I think a reflection of like how birth is meant to be. You know, when you study like mammals, how we retreat to a safe place, like we can't birth, we can't surrender to our bodies when there's all the stimuli, all these things. And that's what you see in the birth vlog, like some of the people in the background. This part of me progressing, laboring through this was going really well. I was feeling really positive. Mentally, I felt good. The perfect combination of in control and also totally surrendered and open, which is I think exactly how you have to birth from little bitty toes coming out to the legs starting to come out. That was the majority of the time that you kind of see in the vlog. Once we got to the place where I started getting pushy, my body started wanting to push this baby out. We requested her to be a little bit more hands-on because we didn't want to just let baby hang out. Like, let's work with a physiological birth here. Let's let my body do its thing. But like, how can we support my body to do that effectively? That's when you kind of see things escalate a little. I think you hear it in my voice and that's when things definitely started to feel very intense towards the end as I started to push. Pushing some legs out. Once we got the butt out, that actually was the first thing that really felt what I would describe as painful because that was kind of like the size of the head. And then you saw how it went down. I won't even go into too much detail here describing what happened as far as actually birthing her because you saw my midwife instructing me. Baby was coming out the way baby should have besides the fact that the feet were coming out first, which isn't really what we hoped for. We're assuming because of the shape of my uterus, as baby started coming out, she literally did a 180 and turned the other direction as I was starting to push her out. And so that's when you hear my midwife say, hey, she's facing the wrong way, which you can totally deliver a baby that way. But one of the things that especially was a concern if that happened is the chin getting stuck. We didn't want the head to get stuck on the pubic bone. So wanted to kind of see if we could get baby moving. So that's why you see her instructing me to put one leg up and then put the other leg up because with my body, we were supporting baby like moving the other direction. So then we kind of knew the countdown from that point to get baby out safely. You see that in the video. It's blurred, but you hear it. To try to just like capture the feeling and emotion, what was happening in those moments. I think again, going back to that feeling of being so in my body, knowing my body is doing this. That's what blew my mind. I didn't have to do anything. My body was doing it. Finally, at the end, pushing the head out was a little intense. We're talking sensationally. The relief and instant high that flooded my body the moment I felt her head pop out. I will chase that feeling for the rest of my life. I cannot describe how magical that felt. I'm in awe of God's design. The fact that I was in some ways in such intense labor. I don't like to use the word pain. I really avoided mentally thinking of that word in the times, but like, let's be real, it is painful. The way the Lord just pairs that with the beauty of this flood of neurotransmitters and oxytocin. Just the joy that flooded the room in that moment. I don't even have words for it. You can't see this in the video because I blurred everything out because like it was a lot to watch, but Cashmere did get to catch her. That's when you hear him then, which is what's so crazy because I asked them, because you see I'm on hands and knees, so I can't really see what's happening. I'm just feeling what's happening as I'm pushing my baby out. But below the belly button was out for minutes before she actually came out because we didn't know the gender. So I was like, were you guys like seeing the gender? But they were both like, honestly, no, we were just focused 
focused on getting that baby out. Like after she comes out, that's the moment where Katrin gets to explain like, it's a girl. And if you go back and watch my first trimester recap, just to have that moment, I'm imagining Katrin like helping to deliver the baby and getting to say it's a boy or it's a girl. I really tried per my midwife's wisdom, not to be too attached to my birth plan or this vision of exactly how my birth would unfold. The entirety of this pregnancy as I was fighting for this home birth, that is the moment I was praying for and envisioning was my husband, father of my baby, catching his baby and saying like, it's a boy, it's a girl. That's why we chose to wait to find out the gender. 10 out of 10 recommend, there's nothing better to hear that in that moment. I think it's so funny when you watch the vlog, like I kept in all the little moments of us talking about how we knew it was a girl because we didn't know, but we thought. So just to be like, it's a girl. Like we were right all along was just so cool. And then they essentially, because I was on hands and knees, passed her through under to me and I got to just grab her and hold her. There are not words to describe that moment. Katrin got to be there. We're both crying, holding our baby. Just the magic of that. Transfer to the bed. So much of the reason that I wanted to have a home birth was that right there. Like getting to go from birthing my baby to cuddling my baby in my bed with my husband, having that skin to skin, not having all that intervention. But you see just the magic of that. Exactly how God intends it to be reveling in the glory of the miracle of this life being brought from the womb to the outside. Literally nothing better. That is what you saw in the vlog. Here is what you didn't see. Thankfully, even though she was breached, baby was great. Tegan, at this point, you know she's a girl. Her name's Tegan James. She was so healthy. Her Apgar scores were eight and nine. She looked great. She was doing great. I felt great. Here's where things took a turn. I'm not delivering my placenta. No one tells you after you push that freaking baby out that you have to push a freaking placenta out. I mean, I knew that, but what's so crazy is how after every possible thing we prepared for as far as what could go wrong in this breach delivery, placenta was not something that ever crossed our minds. I tried pushing, we tried herbs, we tried even just like hydration because we could tell I was a little dehydrated and my, and my liquids were low. So we tried some IV fluids and medication to try to support my body in getting this placenta out, but it was not coming. That's when we're like, okay, this isn't happening happening, we probably need to get to a hospital. I mean it when I say I was so in the high of that experience. Okay, we're going to the hospital, whatever. It's fine. I don't know. It's hard to explain as much as I didn't want to go. I was just still in the magic of we just did this and we got everything we wanted. It's okay. One of the things that my midwife, again, in her infinite wisdom prepared us for along the journey of preparing for birth with her was if something's wrong with baby and we have to transfer to the hospital, of course, mom comes with baby. If something's wrong with mom and baby's fine, if mom wants baby with her and baby transfers in an ambulance or into the hospital with mom, baby gets checked in as a patient, even if baby's fine. If something was wrong with me, baby was fine and I felt comfortable leaving my baby with my husband and they came to the hospital to meet me, Tegan wasn't a patient. I'm so thankful she prepared me for that because I think if I had not processed through that previously, it was just in the moment like, okay, I'm going to the hospital, I just delivered my newborn baby. Of course, I don't want her to leave my arms. She's coming with me. I think that's the choice I would have made had she not prepared me for that, ultimately because I trusted my husband and because I wanted her to not be a patient at the hospital. I decided to leave her with my husband and just transfer myself. We decided to call the ambulance. My midwife came with me. We think that maybe my placenta started to detach but didn't fully detach. So I'm having a little bit of bleeding but nothing super alarming at this point. So it's not really emergent. It's like, okay, okay, we know I'm probably gonna have to go get a DNC to get this out, but it wasn't emergent at the time. The medical personnel come into the house, they put me on the stretcher, like everyone's fine. I'm giving Kashmir and Tegan kisses and saying I'll see you soon. It wasn't too bad. It was the most beautiful, glorious, sunny spring day. As I'm being like transferred on the stretcher, looking at the sky and the trees, being put in the ambulance and the EMTs are asking us questions. They were so kind and celebratory of the fact that we had this beautiful breach home birth. Everything was fine. We didn't even have the sirens on because it was an emergent. About three minutes away from the hospital, I started to get really crampy and I felt blood gushing. And I told my midwife, like, I'm feeling a lot of blood. And they checked me and they're like, you're losing a lot of blood. I started hemorrhaging. And this is when things kind of started to get a little bit scary. I felt the blood leaving my body and I was really remaining calm. I'm still in this truly physical, emotional, spiritual high of, I just did this at home. Nothing can stop me. I freaking pushed a baby out of my vagina. Like, I'm a warrior. 
warrior. I can do anything. I started hemorrhaging and that's when they flipped the sirens on because my blood pressure was dropping and we we're like, we gotta get you in. The fact that like just getting me to where I was supposed to be in the hospital took minutes. They were trying to figure out where's L and D? Oh, second floor. So we're like racing into the elevator. I'm like on the stretcher thing. In the elevator, go up to the second floor. They're like literally rushing me around trying to figure out where to send me, smashing into carts and walls. And then someone's like, no, L and D's on the first floor. So then we go back down and I'm hemorrhaging at this point, losing a lot of blood. This is when we know my blood pressure is dropping to 60 over 40. I'm kind of starting to feel it. And I'm just like, okay, Lord, you got me here. I trust you. I don't know. It's so hard to explain because I'm like hemorrhaging on this stretcher in this hospital. Lord, I trust you. And I was echoing this breath prayer. I don't know why this is what came to me, but I was like, Lord, keep me safe. Lord, keep me safe. It was like this rhythmic prayer. It was as much to like keep myself awake as it was to just ask the Lord to intervene on our behalf. So we finally arrived where we're supposed to in L and D and it is mass chaos. I think there were at least eight people swarming into this room. We're informing them what happened. My midwife, praise the Lord, is there and she knows everything she needs to know. She's answering all their questions, all my numbers, all my stats, my blood type, all these things. It's just chaos. It is absolute chaos. They're like asking me questions and my midwife questions. There's a million people talking at once. They're reading me all these verbal consent rights. They're like, we need to get this out now. One of the OBs manually went up there to retrieve the placenta. And when I tell you that was as painful as the birth, I'm not exaggerating. Oh my God, because my cervix had already started to close, which is part of the issue we were having. We still don't really know exactly how or why any of this happened. My midwife who has been doing this for 25 years has seen like 800 births or something crazy has only ever had this happen one other time. Like this is such a unexpected thing that we could not have prepared for, especially with the Lord like carrying us through everything. And then here it is, my freaking placenta is the problem. They tried to retrieve it manually, was not coming. So that's when they're like, we're rushing you into the OR. We have to put you under general. We're doing a DNC. This is when I kind of started to be like, like, oh, this is bad. I could feel it happening in my body as I felt half my blood leaving my body. As the anesthesiologist is coming in, all these bright lights above me, there's at least 12 medical personnel in this room scrambling around. The anesthesiologist is like asking me if I've eaten, which of course the answer is yes. So they have to intubate me. They're like, we gotta do a DNC. This is what's gonna happen. We have to let you know these are the things that could happen, including a hysterectomy. We might need to take your uterus. I'm really remaining calm. This is, I don't know how many minutes into this whole time in the hospital. It's all such a blur like probably not that many even though so much has happened at this point i'm still just chanting to myself lord keep me safe lord keep me safe when the anesthesia hit my body my uterus relaxed enough that it actually just started to release the placenta on its own so they didn't even have to do a full dnc they went up there to kind of make sure everything was good and clean so many answered prayers praise the lord they did not have to take my uterus how did we get from this like beautiful perfect successful home birth relishing in the beauty of this baby and my husband in my bed to now here like i don't even know how much time has passed at this point, but here we are. Then proceed like a 30 something hour hospital stay. Of course, checking me, doing all these IVs. I think I got like three liters of blood because I had lost so much and five or six bags of IVs. It's such a stark contrast to the way the birth went. And it was just like, how are we here? With all that that happened, here's my answer to the question that I keep receiving every time I'm telling someone this story. Are you okay? Do you have birth trauma? Are you all right? Have you processed this? Do you have any regrets? Do you wish you would have done this in the hospital? My honest to God answer is no. I have no regrets. Obviously, that's not how I wanted things to end up. Half the reason you want a home birth is so you never have to leave your home and you just get to soak in your baby in your bed. I hate hospitals. I had to get a round of antibiotics, which of course, gut health nutritionist here like broke my heart, especially because of the microbiome transfer I'm trying to give to my baby. Of course, like losing so much blood, I was very frail and very weak and very puffy and kind of a little bit in shock. I got everything that I asked for. Looking back to all of the prayers that we were praying for, praying for the Lord to give my midwife discernment over how to guide us through this birth, praying that I would be surrendered to the experience, praying that it would be an intimate, bonding, beautiful thing with my husband. You cannot watch that birth vlog and not tell me that that just makes you fall 10 times more in love with your spouse. Praying that he would get to catch her and tell us the gender, praying that she would get to latch after her, that we'd have the skin to skin, that we'd get to do delayed cord clamping. All of these prayers were answered. Truly, so many friends who I've told this story to just cannot believe how much joy and excitement and wonder I have when I tell them about this. Y'all don't understand. Yes, I ended up in the hospital. Yes, I lost half my blood. Yes, that sucked and I wish it didn't. But I still got everything I asked the Lord for, for months and weeks, especially at the end. Everything that we asked him for, every reason I desired to have a home birth, I pursued.
pursued a natural and medicated birth, all of it. Like I got it. Just thinking about all the prayers that the Lord answered, I wanted to go into labor naturally and not be induced. I wanted to let baby decide when it was ready and when the right time was and to get all those good hormones going for spontaneous labor. I wanted to labor in the comfort of my home in a safe place with people that I trusted, with my husband as my partner. The Lord answered that prayer. I wanted not to be cut open. I wanted to birth my baby through my vagina. I wanted the birth canal. I wanted to populate my baby's skin and microbiome with birth canal. I, I wanted that and he gave us that. I wanted no drugs or medication. Technically, I had drugs and medications after she was born, but he answered answered that prayer. I wanted Kashmir to catch the baby and get to announce the gender. That happened. I wanted all the low intervention post-birth glory of soaking in the skin to skin and working on the first latch and all of that. And we got that. When we found out baby was breached, I knew the chances of getting all these things that I desired and was praying for were so slim. It's kind of hard to describe, but looking back on those weeks when we were making this decision to pursue breach home birth, I just kept praying for clarity from the Lord. And I am telling you, I feel like he kept just whispering to me I want to give you the desires of your heart but you need to trust me I get so emotional when I think about it because it's like that's exactly what he did and he showed up in the most beautiful way I was praying like Lord I want all these things but I also want to trust you and so if you have a different story written for this baby I want to trust you it's so hard to explain because it's like I had this true honest deep rooted confidence that I was going to do this at home I really did believe that I don't think I could have done it if I didn't believe that. But I also had this weird kind of like gut instinct that I would end up at a hospital, which is hard to explain how both of those things were true. I swear it was like the Lord preparing me. I know it sounds wild because obviously I wish I didn't hemorrhage. I wish I didn't lose half my blood. I wish I didn't get antibiotics. I wish I didn't get put under general anesthesia and intubated and have to sit in a hospital for 30 hours, not sleeping at all. I wish I didn't have any of that. I would take that any day because my baby was healthy. My baby was born at home. My baby was not intervened upon. She got all the things that I wanted for her. And I got to have the magic of that empowering experience of doing that on my own. Like I could truly cry thinking about how different I think I would feel had I gone through all that and not had the empowering experience of the birth that we had. If I hadn't believed that I could do it and I just decided to pursue the C-section from the start, I would have had the retained placenta. That stuff would have happened anyways. It had nothing to do with my birth. It was just a fluke thing. I would have had the hospital experience that I didn't desire regardless. So the fact that I got to have that empowering experience was such a gift and an answered prayer. It was truly and honestly everything I could have dreamed of, which is funny to say because in a lot of ways, my birth didn't look like I expected. All this time I spent dreaming of having an unmedicated birth, trying to get myself to the belief that it's something that I could do. Watching so many videos, I feel like there's so many things that I kind of expected in my birth or maybe maybe wanted in my birth as far as envisioning how it would play out, laboring in a tub, maybe delivering baby in a water birth, having worship music played over me, having birth mantras and scriptures written on cards that I was meditating on, getting to like sway in my robe in the kitchen while I listen to worship music and breathe through my early contractions. And I don't know, in some ways I had kind of these pictures of like, oh, oh like breathing through my early contractions. I did not get that stuff did not happen. Someone asked me that about the birth tub. Like, did you labor in the water? Y'all, it did not even cross my mind. Like I was already so far into that. The moment that those first contractions happened, it truly did not even cross my mind. I mean, I think because I knew that we were going to deliver in the tub, but I still, even going into that, expected to labor in the tub, but we did not have time to blow and fill that tub up. Just truly didn't even cross my mind. I'm truly confident it would have been a little bit less painful had I used water and heat to work through some of that, I wouldn't change it. It was so glorious. I freaking pushed my baby out, feet first, with no drugs, in my house, next to my bed, with my husband. I did that. I freaking did that. And I will forever, for the rest of my life, know that I did that. There's something so empowering about that. And I think that's one of the reasons the Lord designed birth the way that he did, because even just getting to walk into motherhood with that experience, I cannot tell you in the last four months, the number of times I have reached the end of myself 
myself where I am so exhausted and so fatigued and just wanting to break down and literally saying, I can't do this because I have not slept in 46 hours. I'm so tired and my boobs hurt. Like all the things that you experience postpartum with a newborn. And I was able to tell myself, no, you did this thing, you can do anything. I now have that for the rest of my life to say, I came to the end of myself. I met myself in a way that I never have in my life. Even being an athlete and doing hard things and running half marathons and pushing myself in ways that I have in my life, nothing will ever compare to that. And now I have that. That is how I stepped into motherhood. That is how I went from maiden to mother. I got to have this moment of transformation, of reaching the end of myself and truly becoming a new woman, a mother. It was the most amazing thing ever. <laughs> Telling one of my friends who's not married, doesn't have kids, asking about my birth. I was explaining all this to her and she's like, why are you saying it was glorious? It sounds terrible. Was it painful? I was like, hell yeah, it was painful. She's like, why is that a good thing? I'm like, because it was so much more than that. It's so hard to explain if you haven't been through it. I know for the women who have, like you can tell me, I know you know what I'm talking about. It's worth it. And it's so much bigger and deeper than that. Silly as the sounds, you know the book, The Giver, that you had to read in like seventh grade, I think. That novel has stuck with me the entirety of my life because I've always thought about how like when we try to remove the pain from life, we also numb out the glory. That's the truth of the Christian experience. That's the truth of living on this side of heaven. And it's the truth woven into birth. When we try to numb the pain and avoid the pain and run from the pain, we don't get the glory. We don't get that high that I can't even put into words. There's nothing better. It's the reason I, I push that baby out. I'm literally like post hemorrhage in the hospital looking at my midwife and my husband saying, I want to do this again. It's addictive y'all. I see why so many women who have natural births have like five and six kids. Cause I'm like, I want it. I want to do it a million times over. But I want you to hear me say is the reason I share this is because my honest, sincere hope and prayer is that if this empowers even one woman, you listening right now, even one woman to believe in herself that she can do this, whether you just found out you have a breech baby and you think that you have no chance of having the birth you desire, or whether you just think that natural birth is crazy, but it's kind of in the back of your mind thinking about it. My honest, sincere prayers of even one woman gets to have the experience that I had because she hears this story here. That would be an answered prayer in every way and worth sitting down for so long to tell you this story. I had the experience I had. I pursued the path I did because of the stories of women who went before me, who encouraged me, who made me believe that I could do it, who made me believe that it was worth it and worth the hard work and worth the sacrifice and worth the pain. And now I'm like sitting on the other side of having had this experience and I'm over here like, please hear me say this is glorious and beautiful and you can't do it. My heart breaks not just for women who don't get to experience that, but mostly for the woman who wants that and doesn't think she can have it. If I had had any other provider who would have just seen that my baby was breached and told me, sorry, you have no other option, we're doing a C-section, and I would have been robbed that experience. I know it would have been beautiful and glorious and the Lord redeems. I feel like I have to caveat everything. I'm not saying that a C-section or any other birth story of medicated birth cannot be as beautiful and glorious. The Lord can't be in that. I'm not saying that at all, but I'm just forever grateful that he answered those prayers for me. As long as this story time has been, there is so much more I can say about birth. I am just gonna say, if you have questions, if there's anything else I can share about this story, this experience, the prep, any of it, drop it in the comments. I don't know whether I should do like a follow-up Q&A to this, <laughs> maybe like just some additional videos or blog posts or ways that I can answer your questions or tell you the rest of my story. I feel like I for sure want to talk more about the mental and emotional and spiritual side of preparing for this experience because I have a million things I could say on that front. Let me know because again, clearly I could talk forever. If you want more support for a healthy pregnancy, make sure you check out my pregnancy playlist, which I'll link for you below because I have so many videos on supplementation, nutrition, all the things that carried me through my pregnancy, which I also believe is so much of the reason that I did get to have the successful birth that I had. And just make sure you stay tuned as I am inviting y'all in now to my postpartum experience and what's to come with recovering from this blood loss, continuing to learn how to feed my baby, nourish my baby, currently with my body, soon with real food. There's so much of this journey that I would love to share with you guys. As I'm looking to heal my own body from this recovery, as I'm looking to lose postpartum weight from a place of love and freedom and not shame, as I'm looking to prepare for conceiving for baby number two, all of the things, I definitely plan to kind of just bring y'all along the rest of this journey with me. So make sure you subscribe if you want all of that to come. 
please hear. You are a warrior. You are a woman. God designed us so special. I will see y'all in the next one. Yes, you were worth all of it. I'm so thankful for you. <laughs> <laughs> Oh my gosh, you